Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of Prime Talk. My name is Lisa Kinski. I'm your host, and I'm here today with our guest, Piotr Pisash, with Uncapped. Was that even remotely right? It was. It was. Thank you, Lisa, for having me. Yes, thank you so much for being here. So everybody, Piot joins us today from Uncapped. Um, he is the CEO of Uncapped, which is a leading provider of working capital for Amazon sellers and e-commerce businesses alike. So we'll talk about Uncapped a little bit later on. But right now, we want to learn about you. How did you come to find Uncapped? I peeked briefly at your form before we started, and you've done some pretty exciting things with your life. So I guess just start telling us where you're from and then hit some highlights. <laughs> Cool. I'm I'm Polish originally. Um, I moved to London in 2019. You know, started my first work was investment banker. I hated it. Mm. I first week I knew I will quit, but the day I hit my first first bonus, I still remember this day. You know, I I, I was I always got the messages, text messages about the large transfer coming into the bank account. And I expected this this day to get my bonus. The text didn't come, and I was panicking. I checked the account. Okay, money were there, so I could quit. Uh, I quit that day, um, and I worked for Google uh, then for for several years. Um, I left Google to be a, a VC, so I was a VC investor for many years. Uh, you know, I love technology. What did you do while you were at Google, though? So from investment banking, which I think is funny. We've had a couple of guests on here who did investment banking, and they said they hated it. Um, so you did investment banking, and then you were a VC after Google. What did you do while at Google? I was, in, generally speaking, like finance and analytics team. You know, I had a I had a very cool job. So I was working with our country managers, help them make better decisions. You know, so I was looking a lot at the numbers and helping them understand the business, understand the trends, you know, how we make money, how we could make more money. Um, great learning to see really impressive business leaders every day and, you know, see, you know, what questions they ask and, and help them answer those questions. So I would say a great learning, you know, for a, for a young, very young person at the time. Uh, but then at some point I realized I really like Google became so big, you know, I joined when they were still a cool company at the time when I was leading them, they were massive already. And it was 10 years ago and I wanted to be closer to the founders uh, and entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So I left to be a VC. Okay. And how long did you do that? I was a VC for about four years. Again, great learning experience, you know, to meet a lot of entrepreneurs to work with a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, see the mistakes they make, uh, see how we operate, see those who are successful, you know, how we do that. Analyze thousands of businesses, you know, I think, and, you know, see all of business models and you quickly pick up, you know, what's working, what's not working, you know, like what's a good company, what's a bad company. Uh, I loved it, but at some point I realized that SAVC, I can only work with a very, very few select, selected founders, you know, like I said, you see, you probably say yes to one, two companies a year. And there are so many great founders I wanted to work with. And maybe they didn't have a perfect business, but as a VC, you have to invest in a perfect company. And I was like, your business is good enough. You will make a lot of money. I want to help you. I want to help you, but I couldn't. Um, so then I realized the opportunity to do so is actually through providing debt capital to them because a debt investor you actually can work with many 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 more companies and no one was giving money to these founders like these entrepreneurs especially in the e-commerce space they had no one to go to they were like my business is booming but i cannot have i can't find money for inventory i cannot find money for 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 marketing no one wants to give it to me so um i thought hey it's a big opportunity let's uh, change it and what motivated you to work so closely with entrepreneurs and brand owners? Were your parents entrepreneurs or was that just always an interest of yours? No, my dad had a small company. My mom was very risk averse. And for a long time, I thought it's not for me. Like I never, 
I never thought that I'll be the entrepreneur. Like it never crossed my mind. But then I always loved to question things and change them. Like when I had the bosses, I was always the one who was like, no, we should do it differently, challenging them, you know, questioning them. And it was very frustrating experience for them uh, and for myself, for more for them than for me. Uh, so at one point, um, though, I was thinking about this opportunity so much, like the moment I knew I had to quit my job is after like three months, there was not a single day when I wasn't thinking about doing this business. And that's when I knew, okay, let's try. Yeah. When you're all consumed in it, but how did you, cause looking at your guest form, you also climbed count goodness, Mount Kilimanjaro. My goodness gracious. How do you have time to train for that? And also be a VC and, and work full time and help brands. And how do you manage the two? You know, this is the, there's a crazier story about this. The climbing Kilimanjaro was my honeymoon trip. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. So I con managed to convince my now ex-wife to do that, uh, you know, right after our wedding, I just thought, Hey, what would it be, you know, what would it cement our relationship more? than us trying to, you know, conquer this massive mountain and spend, you know, one week in the cold and the heights with altitude sickness. Uh, so we did that. Okay. And that's and a I, little ironic because you said now ex-wife. <laughs> well, I can tell you that she asked me, like she was, she, first time she asked for a divorce was, you know, on a day two of this trip, you know, she was like, how did you convince me to this crazy idea? I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. I'm divorcing you the moment we come back. Like we stayed together for many more years, but uh, yeah, it, 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 at the end of the day, like we, we, we split up the moment I like at the same time I sat the company, I think this is the time when I knew, Hey, I have so much more energy, so much more passion to, 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 to do things. I want to change things. And I, I'm not the same person as, you know, a teenager who met her, you know, in high school and, and we parted ways. Sure. I, sometimes though, when we have our guests on, oftentimes when they have experiences, you know, like climbing Kilimanjaro, or we had a guest on who um, had gone abroad and become a, a sea captain and, and a, a boat and all these things, they have a lot of realizations about themselves, their entrepreneurial journey, how they want to run their businesses. Did you have any big pivotal takeaways that kind of changed the course of your life on while on that trip? Or is it so physically demanding that you can't think of anything other than just keep moving? <laughs> Not on that. I, listen, this trip was so many years ago that I, I don't think I had any realizations on that particular trip. Uh, I would say, you know, there are many other trips I, I, during which I had some realization. So, you know, like I usually, I love to go to the Burning Man, you know, to be detached from the world for a week and, you know, you know, explore so many different crazy things, but also your brain is basically rewiring and you start to rethink about the life and the way you operate, uh, you know, how you work, what you work on, uh, about your relationships. Um, yeah, I think like there I have a lot of realizations and I changed my life a lot during trips like that. Okay. So for those who are unfamiliar, tell us a little bit about what Burning Man is and then maybe some of the takeaways, some perhaps in business oh. that you've oh got God. from Burning Man. <laughs> I, 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 I really would love... <laughs> I'm worried with Albina, one of the exclusive burners who are, you know, preaching about what Burning Man is to everyone. So I'll try to keep it very short. Um, basically, this is just like gathering of people in the, in, in, in the desert in Nevada, uh, where a lot of, you know, crazy things happen. But basically, like, in principle, there's a lot of communities uh, going there and, you know, showcasing who they are, who they really are, you know, and just you can go over and explore whatever aspects of life you'd like to explore. If you want to do yoga, you can do a lot of yoga. If you want to do party, you can do party. If you want to, you know, run a marathon, you can run an ultra marathon. So it's just one place and one moment on earth when you can truly be yourself and, and explore anything you wanted to explore. 
And so what are some of the realizations you've come to while at Burning Man? Because like you said, you go to disconnect. And in those times, your brain's kind of ruminating on these other areas of your life, you know? So what have you, what have you come to realize and maybe applied even into your own business today? I think, you know, visualizations are particularly important when you have a difficult moment in life or at work. And, you know, we had a, we are now a fairly successful company, but we had a lot of tough, many tough moments. Um, and um, in these darkest, darkest moments, uh, when it's very, very tough for you, uh, for me, the realization was that I have a responsibility towards my company and towards myself to really set an example to everyone. And to do that, I really have to take care of myself. And that meant that I really have to focus on working out a lot, on eating healthy, on sleeping, because otherwise I will not perform as a CEO, I won't perform as a founder, I will not perform as a, as a friend, as a partner, as, as a manager. Um, and that's when I like really made this very strict commitment to myself to you know, work out many times a week and to eat healthy, I put sugars, sleep enough. And this really helped me to go through the very, very dark times uh, in the history of the company. I love that. I think that's gonna tie a lot into the question set that we have at the end of the episode. So we'll, we'll kind of abbreviate that right here. Um, but talk to us about the the road to finding uncapped i was i never know how to use the term because you're the founder of a company so when you founded it i never know what's grammatically right but you know we were talking about you've gone through quite an evolution so talk to us about when you created uncapped where you've been and where you are now sure we launched i started to work on a company five years ago and we launched about four years ago initially with idea of Revenue-based finance. This is something we don't do anymore. But at that time, it felt like a very smart idea to me. Mm -hmm. Basically, we were giving the loans, which were repaid as a share of the revenues. Okay. It seemed like, on a face value, it seemed great, right? Like, hey, I'm giving you, let's say, 100,000, and then you give me 20% of revenue until you repay the loan plus a fee. The business scaled very, very well during e-commerce. There was a lot of competition in this space, so many other companies emerged. Uh, there was loads of VC funding coming in into this space, funding you know us and our competitors. Um, but you know, at some point during this journey, I realized that this business model or this particular product has many faults. And the biggest one is it actually penalizes good customers. What I mean by that is because a cost of a loan is fixed, but the duration of a loan depends on your revenue growth. So the faster your revenue grow, better customer you are, faster you repay the loan for the same price, so your loan effectively becomes much more expensive. Mm. Yet for the bad clients, you know, they were repaying the loan, not in like six months we were anticipating, but you know, nine, 10, 12, 14, 15. So they were getting deal of their life. Mm. And when you have a product which, you know, penalizes good, good customers and incentivizes bad customers, what happens? Good customers aren't coming back, back and bad customers tell their friends and they all yeah. come to you. <laughs> so we had to really, it took us two years, uh, but we really had to change our product and uh, really move towards much more traditional uh, lending, still focus on e-commerce space and Amazon space. So I think what really distinguished us from, from many other companies is we work on exclusively with Amazon sellers and you know Shopify sellers and you know e-commerce sellers in general. And we know them well, we understand them well, we give them more money than anyone else. We give them better terms than anyone else. And this allows us to you know, have a competitive advantage over many other uh, uh, competitors and banks, et cetera. 
And before we get into exactly how you know you operate, who you help, I'm curious because uh, we often find that services are created by sellers themselves. Have you ever dipped your toe into Amazon selling personally? No, never, actually. No? Do you have any no. interest in it? And if the answer is no, that's okay because I don't either. <laughs> uh, a lot of people in my company uh, are Amazon sellers. And you know, I started like the company started. Um, by working with actually Shopify sellers. So my first customers mm -hmm. were, were Shopify sellers. We only went to Amazon uh, later on. You know, my my partner, my fiance, she has, you know, e-commerce business. A lot, all my friends are uh, e-commerce sellers. I have uh, loads of friends who are Amazon sellers. I speak to Amazon sellers every single day. Unfortunately, you know, today I'm running a company which has, you know, a lot of employees and you know, thousands of gas clients. So I don't think I have time anymore to launch Amazon business. Although I think about it every day. I think there are so many niches I love and so many amazing Amazon companies I meet every day that I'm like, oh my God, I have such an amazing business. I'd love to have something similar. Get involved. Yeah, that would be, maybe we can have you on a little bit later once you've launched that first brand, because it seems like it may become all consuming like the uncapped idea was when you're in VC and you're like, oh, I can't yeah. let go of this idea. So um, so talk to us more about uncapped, who you help, what your rates are, the the structure of the business now. Um, just tell us all about it. Awesome. As I mentioned, like we are provider of working capital to the, to the Amazon sellers and e-commerce brands. We work with Amazon sellers from small to large. For the smallest brands, we have a product called Amazon Starter Capital. And this is for sellers who do less than, uh, you know, 100,000 a month in, in revenue in GMV. And for them, we offer very simple, very quick loans. You just come to us, give us access to your Amazon account, give us access to your bank account, and we'll give you the offer within, you know, uh, a few hours or, or, or one day max. Very simple process, very straightforward. For the larger clients, up to 5 million revenue per year, we offer them, we offer them the term loans up to 12 months, you know, simple amortizing term loans, uh, very customized to you. And finally, for the larger sellers with, you know, more than 5 million turnover per year, uh, we offer them the line of credit where we actually commit to them the capital for a long time. And, you know, with this commitment, as long as they keep the milestones, we agree them together. They can keep drawing and drawing and borrowing. So they don't have to borrow everything at once, but they can plan the purchase going forward, knowing that they have access to the capital when needed. I like that you guys have the different tiers, tiered model to help sellers of all different sizes. I'm curious, where should sellers, if they're listening and they say, oh, I, I need some help with funding, do they need to be based out of a specific geography, like only in Europe or only in the US, or do you have a global service? We operate in United States, in UK, Netherlands, Poland, and Spain. Well, there you go. That's a pretty wide net, I would say. It is. <laughs> Listen, like almost... Like majority, vast, vast, vast majority of our clients are in the United Kingdom and uh, United States. Mm -hmm. And these are the two geographies we really, really focus on. I think, you know, if you're Netherlands, Spain, Poland, happy to chat to you, but I, I doubt many listen, listeners are from there. But if yes, please message me. I'll make sure you get special code or, or discount or something. <laughs> You heard it here first, folks. And if you want to learn more about Uncapped, you can check out their website at weareuncapped.com. Um, and if you are calling in from Netherlands, Poland, Spain, all of those other countries that Piotr just mentioned, you can email him directly. Emails P I O T R at weareuncapped.com for the uh, audio listeners. For visual, it's right there on the screen. Um, amazing. Anything else that we need to know about Uncapped before we move on to our seven questions about entrepreneurship? Uh, I think, you know, happy, happy to, you know, uh, everyone just, if you could visit the website, I think we worked very, very hard to make it clear, but yeah, best working capital for you. So check it out. Amazing. Amazing. So now we're going to move into our question set and I would love to hear from you as a founder. I think you, you kind of really touched on this in the beginning, but it's always worth kind of driving the point home as a founder of a company, managing a team which is helping thousands of clients. 
How are you managing your own stress? I think I mentioned, you know, but like for me, uh, it's about three things. It's about working out. It's about eating healthy and sleeping enough. And, you know, I, I, I think, you know, all three aspects are crucial to make sure, you know, you can release the stress and, and, and manage the stress. And I notice that whenever I travel a lot and I cannot do three of those things usually, I get very cranky and very, very stressed. So, <laughs> so, uh, I have a personal trainer, uh, and, you know, we work out very, very hard, uh, a lot, and it really helps me, you know, be focused, motivated. Uh, I have a, you know, food delivered to home every day, special diet. Again, you know, really helps you stay lean, helps you stay focused. And, you know, I really highly recommend everyone wearing Whoop or Apple Watch for, to, you know, to track sleep, to make sure, you know, you get enough of the rest every, every day. Yeah. The sleep is so important. There have been so many advancements in like sleep analytics technology, right? There's this map that you can buy to put over your mattress that tells that like regulates your temperature. And of course, like the watches and the rings, it's, it's crazy, but yeah, it's funny. We were just having a, a, I was on a partner mastermind the other day. And one of the questions just to kind of get to know each other was, you know, how, how many hours of sleep do you get? And everybody's answer was, well, when I'm at home, I get seven or eight, but when I'm on the road yeah. or like, it's so difficult to keep that sleep going. Cause you're right. We have such a, a hustle mentality of like, I always have to be here. I have to, you know, first one in last one out, got to grind, but it's, it's true. What you said before, if you're not taking care of yourself, you can't show up as a partner, as a manager, as a friend, as a founder. So, um, I, I love that that's your philosophy and personal trainer, meal delivery service, eliminating a lot of decision-making. I love it. Use that power for the business. Absolutely love it. Exactly. I, that's exactly what that, you know, you don't have to think about it. It just happens. Yeah. I, I love that streamlining everything. So curious, what books do you recommend that every entrepreneur read? Or can you think of a book that has had a, a positive impact on your entrepreneurial journey? I love reading business books, you know, and, and, you know, biographies of uh, great entrepreneurs, you know, uh, the one which is maybe slightly more niche, I highly recommend to everyone is like, who is Michael Ovitz? It's about the founder of a company called CAA, which completely, you know, redefined the Hollywood. I love the hard things about hard things, a uh, really great, you know, entrepreneurial book, but also think it's important to read some, you know, um, fiction, uh, to also, you know, maybe expand your mind. The one which I think might be niche to a lot of, uh, listeners here, they highly, highly recommend is a return from stars by Stanislav Lem. Okay. Stanislav Lem is a Polish science fiction writer who wrote a also a book called Solaris, for example, uh, you might have seen the movie. And uh, extremely intelligent guy, uh, you know, he is not worldwide famous because, you know, he was writing during communist era, but, you know, CIA didn't believe that he could exist. CIA believed that he is a group of people because no one could have so much knowledge and so much insight and so much creativity and ingenuity to write a book like, like, a book like this or books like this. So um, I... Highly, highly recommend. If you love science fiction, I highly recommend uh, Stanis of Lamb and, and uh, his books to everyone. Okay. We'll get the links for the books and drop them in the description of the episode afterwards so you guys can awesome. check that out. Um, and so kind of in that same vein, what are three habits that you think every successful entrepreneur must adopt for themselves? I cannot recommend everything for everyone, but like for me, Number one trait and habit is punctuality. Like, you know, I I absolutely hate people who are late. And for me, being punctual is a must. And I demand extreme functionality from 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 a team. I think it's it's disrespectful. And and you know to me how punctual the company is reflects, you know, how well organized it is. Uh so so this is definitely the uh the one. Another habit to me is, you know, um, frankly, taking care of yourself. I think, you know, to me, how, how you take care of yourself 
what I mean by this is, you know, like, do you work out, you know, do you sleep enough, do you, do you dress appropriately, you know, mm. this also, this reflects on you so much. And like, if you're not taking care of yourself, how will you take care of the others, you know, like on the plane, they always tell you, you know, put the, put the face, put the, put the air mask on yourself. So like, I believe like I have to take care of myself to take care of other people in my life, in my, in my, um, uh, in my company mm -hmm. and finally the uh, last habit which i think is very important is um spending time with 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 friends because you know you have you should have life outside of work it's important for the grounding you know if you don't you might lose the touch with 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 your family with your friends with with reality you know and I had a moment in my life when work was all consuming and I didn't have time for, for, for the closest ones. And I think I, I, I really missed it later on in my tough moments. So I, I work very hard to even at busy times, find time for the family and friends. Yeah. So punctuality, personal care and personal relationships. Yeah. are all things to prioritize. I love it. Um, what are some tools that you're currently using that have had a positive impact to your business? And this can be this can be Slack or this can be something as easy as a, a timer to keep you on on schedule and punctual every day. So what tools are you using right now? I love Slack. Uh, I love Superhuman. Actually, I love I love software. I love new software, you know, so I'm using, I think any latest technology you see, I, I pro or software, <laughs> I love trying this, like, you know, I'm still struggling to find a good calendar tool. Um, but I use Notion for, not Notion, I think Motion for, you know, syncing calendars across personal life and, and you know, coloring automatically. Okay. Uh, of of course, you know, WhatsApp is absolute game changer, uh, especially, especially here. I'm thinking, is there some other obscure, obscure, obscure tool? Um, I think where my company is very good at is like, we are very good at integrating Slack with many other services. So, you know, we actually operate, you know, I get a lot of Intel by a lot of Slack channels, which give me the, you know, real-time data on the business, you know, what's happening with every client, you know, automatic notifications if the client is approved or rejected or, you know, there's some competitive tension in the deal, you know, when the, every customer feedback, you know, I get a notification about, you know, every customer, you know, if they didn't like something about the onboarding process, you know, how they rate it, any trust pilot review, anything, you know, I find it very important to uh, have Slack very well integrated into every aspect of your company. So you have one place to, to see them all. Our our team has done similar things. I can take zero credit. I just see the channels, but they've done similar things. And it really helps you to be agile and identify, you know, if you continue to see maybe a bunch of your uh, clients who have applied for funding have been denied. It's like, okay, what's happening here? Is there a problem exactly. with the tech? Is it, did we get exactly. on some weird list? Like it, it allows you to be really agile and proactive. So exactly. Slack, that's, that's been the most commonly mentioned yeah. tool on the show so far. <laughs> Absolutely. Great tool. So three more questions. What is one thing that you wish you knew before starting your own business? I wish I knew how hard it is and how long it is. You know, um, I used to be in YPO and they have a saying, it's lonely at the top. Mm. And I don't think I ever realized how lonely it is. You know, I was listening, I think it was Elon Musk who said, but you know, people don't realize, but you know, as a founder, the problem is as a founder, the role is very difficult because every day, all you do is only solve the problems. And usually the problems which couldn't be solved by anyone else, because if your employees could, could solve these problems, they wouldn't come with these problems to you. So, you know, every day, every part of the organization, surface is the problems we can solve and you have to help them or at least try to help them or pretend to try to help them ideally help them um or i don't know cheer them you know support them in in, in trying to solve them and it's it's daunting you know like you there's no one to praise you you know as a founder like you have to praise the employees who's there to praise you who's 
very you know to give you promotion you know the raise uh, the reward recognition no one right so uh i wish i knew how difficult mentally this role is um before i started i still dream about being a police sometimes you know there are these tough days when i'm like oh i wish i was an employee <laughs> i think we all have those days i'm i'm not a founder certainly but i some days i do miss like man, I miss being a bartender. Just you go, you hang out with people, you go home at the right. end of the night with cash and you go to bed. Like it's <laughs> exactly simple life, simple, simple life. life, turn your brain off and just make drinks. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So with that in mind, what would be one piece of advice you would give entrepreneurs starting their Amazon journey today? Um, pick Pick right category, definitely. I think you know. I I think you know. I see. I think there are a few categories where I see people having way more success um, than the others. You know, I think like apparel, for example, is a very difficult category. But you know, in general, I would say you know, CPG, home goods. I think I see a lot of great businesses there, um, and really like. Uh, make sure you have a really distinctive product i think nowadays the problem we see many amazon sellers have is their problem their products can be copycatted very very easily so like maybe make sure you have something unique uh, uh about your product or brand and ideally it's both product and a brand that's unique uh and distinctive and so that in fact, that means you can have advantage competitive advantage you know, in, in the long run yeah, we, we just had on our sister podcast, Sellernomics, we just hosted um, the founder of Gemba and they help bring unique niche products to market through sourcing and they help you identify, okay, this this works out well, this doesn't work out. Um, let's get you a patent here to try to create something that is really unique exactly. and less copyable um, so that you have kind of that, that sticking power. Um, exactly. Last question for you. What is your prediction for the next 12 months in e-commerce? What do you expect to see now that we're kind of on the other side of the pandemic and things are a little more predictable, I guess? Air quotes. <laughs> they are. They are. I think I think we'll continue to have another 12 tough months in the e-commerce. I think, you know, the last 12 months have been very difficult, you know, for sort of price pressure. I think consumers don't have a lot of money to spend. And I do think it will take a bit longer than everyone expects uh, for the economy to uh, to turn around. So I think, you know, pr products with, uh, you know, lower prices, you know, uh, still will be the winners. And, you know, this this the more premium the product is, I think the tougher it will, like, it's very difficult right now to be this like mid market product. I think if you're like very expensive, people always have money to buy you. Uh, but then if you're like this mid price product, oh, the space is very tough. Everyone is going for cheaper alternatives. Uh, so uh, it will be another still 12 difficult months. Uh, keep the prices low, keep your OPEX low. Okay. That's in interesting feedback. I will have to touch base in 12 months and see what the reality has been. I, yes. I feel like I, from from my perspective, people have al almost been shying away from the cheapest products. I, my brain immediately goes to Timu or Temu, however it's pronounced. Yeah. They have the cheapest option. And I know everybody in my circle, we avoid it like the plague because we're like, not going to waste my money on something that is going to be. But it's the fastest growing e-commerce platform right now. I know. I've yet to find right. somebody who's bought off of it, though. So that's I wonder how they get those numbers. Is it well, is it just less adopted in the U.S. maybe? I think so. I think so. But general trend, you know, there's drive for price and people buy a lot of stuff there. Another thing we see a lot is with TikTok, the growth of TikTok. Oh, well, my God. Well, yes, that's crazy. Yeah, that's insane. And, and I'm very curious, you know, with US potentially banning TikTok, like what's going to happen because a lot of businesses rely on TikTok. But you know, if it's not banned, I would recommend everyone get on this trend, you know, like, like the numbers we see are crazy. 
And just for the record, we are recording this on March 28th, 2024. This episode will come out in a couple of months. So th- there will either be, I'm sure there'll be movement one way or another with the bill. Yeah. We'll see what happens when this goes live we'll with TikTok. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> um, Piaf, thank you so much for being here with me today. I um, want to remind everybody that y'all can learn more about Uncapped at weareuncapped.com. You can reach out directly to Piot at his email, P-I-O-T-R at weareuncapped.com. Um, or you can connect with him on LinkedIn. I'm sure you can grab the name from the description and find him on LinkedIn. Um, he also has a lovely team. I had the opportunity to meet some of your team at the Prosper Show, and I've been emailing with them. Um, great friendly folks to work with. So highly recommend, but thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. And thank you so much for everyone who tuned in. If you liked what you heard, please be sure to give us a thumbs up, share your thoughts with us in the comments, subscribe to the show, and we will see you all on the next one. Bye.